talk about sort of uh, stability as well in, in fission. And we started talking about uh, binding energy and nuclear binding energy and sort of what it is. So, you know, nuclear binding energy, for example, is, you know, the difference that sort of occurs or the energy difference uh, that comes from uh, the formation basically of a nucleus. Um, there is sort of, as we talked about last time, a difference in the mass of the uh, sort of particles that make up the nucleus, which are sometimes referred to as a nucleon, and the actual mass of the sort of nucleus or the isotope or the atom itself. And that difference is uh, what is sometimes referred to as mass defect. And that little difference in sort of mass is going to be kind of converted into energy. Um, and there's kind of a couple of different ways you can do the calculation. Uh, really sort of uh, the way we sort of relate that is through Einstein's equation of E equals mc squared. Um, C is the speed of light, which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Uh, M is was referred to in sort of this application as the mass defect. We find the mass defect by basically taking the uh, total number of protons and times it by the atomic mass of a proton, which is that 1.007825 number. And we add it to the number of neutrons that are present uh, times the mass of a neutron. And we then subtract it from the mass of the isotope itself. And again, there's gonna be a sort of slight mass difference between those two. And that is what is referred to as the mass defect. At that point, you can sort of put it into Einstein's equation, which is sort of what we did over in this region at the very end last time, I think. And again, this guy on the left here being the mass defect, this guy here obviously being the speed of light squared. That gives us a number that is close to being in the units of joules, except that it is AMU meter squared, second squared. And as we talked about last time, a joule is actually kilograms meter squared, second squared. Uh, so we do a conversion using pretty much Avogadro's number to the 26, which gets us to basically kilograms. And that gets us to kilograms meter squared, second squared, which is the same as a joule. Um, and again, that's how we go from say here to here, again, with this relationship that these guys basically are equal to each other. One way that we very calmly though sort of display binding energy is to give the value as binding energy per um, nucleon. And a nucleon again is the number of protons and neutrons. So essentially it's like the mass number. And that's why we divided it here by 19. And it gave us this value here, which is 1.25 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, for this fluorine one we did. Um, alternative to that, there are some conversions which are really based off of sort of Einstein's equation. And you could, if you wanted to, without using Einstein's equation, and just sort of using these conversion factors, you could start with the AMU, which is our mass defect. And again, you could use this conversion to take it to mega electron volts, which is also a common unit of sort of uh, binding energy as well. And use the mega electron volts to the joule conversion to get us to the exact same sort of result here. So. Um, again, there's two sort of ways you could do it. They're really based off the same way, um, but sometimes people will use sort of the um, conversion part as well. So again, uh, sometimes given in both units or both units are very common, either uh, mega electron volts per nucleon is a common sort of binding energy or joules per nucleon as well. It's also a very common sort of unit. What is, again, binding energy per nucleon sometimes used for as well? Again, it, it is a measure as well of sort of stability. Uh, sort of the higher the binding energy per nucleon is, the more stable something is in terms of an isotope. So we can kind of compare stability, if you will, uh, by looking at something like this as uh, binding energy per nucleon. Any questions on that stuff we talked about, I think, uh, last time there? <clears throat> OK, uh, so let's take a look then. I think what we got next is kind of the example we scribbled on. 
So this is uh, just the example we just did there. And so we'll just kind of scroll through it. You can see we end up with the same number as we ended up there on the other page there. So uh, let's take a look at a graph though. So what we see on this graph is the nuclear binding energy per nucleon. Again, sorry about the arrows here, but again, that's uh, binding energy per nucleon basically. And what we see is as it increased, uh, increases, the nuclear stability also increases. Actually, it maxes out right about there at our good friend iron 56, as you can see, is kind of the highest point in terms of stability. Uh, so again, this is also a good measure of stability when you calculate this to compare a couple of different isotopes. And again, you can see most kind of stable guys are in this sort of range. And again, here is our iron 56 sort of maxing out at the top in terms of sort of stability. So why don't you give this a go and see uh, what you come up with and we'll talk about it here. There's a couple of numbers that might be helpful. We wanna calculate the mass defect and the nuclear binding energy per nucleon in mega electron volts. Why don't we do both? So why don't you do mega electron volts per nucleon? And why don't you also do joules per nucleon just to practice doing both units. So take a couple of minutes here and see what you come up with. And again, another conversion that might be helpful that we saw earlier, uh, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. All right, take a couple minutes, see what you come up with and we will talk about it. So we're looking for carbon 16, in case you don't have a periodic table, you're in a chemistry class, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Carbon is number six on the periodic table still. So i uh, take a couple minutes and see what you come up with. And kind of see how we're doing here. So again, we wanna really start out probably with figuring out obviously a number of protons and neutrons there are. We also obviously wanna figure out, uh, you know, sort of that mass defect. So again, going to the periodic table tells us carbon is six. And then obviously the 16 there is the mass number. Uh, that means the number of protons here would be six. Uh, the number of neutrons would be 16 minus six. I'm gonna go with 10 without the aid of a calculator there. To find our mass defect, we're going to take our six protons. We're gonna times it by the atomic mass of a proton, 1.00783 AMU. Uh, we're then gonna add it to our neutrons, which is 10 times the mass of a neutron. We'll use the numbers they gave us. We're then gonna subtract it from the atomic mass of the isotope in this case, which is 16.014701 uh, AMU. And that should get us a number, let's see here, six times 1.00783 plus uh, 10 times 1.0086 minus or 16.014701. A lot of numbers there. Uh, that is going to get us something like uh, 0 0.11828 AMU. That is going to be our mass defect. Again, a little bit of mass is gonna be kind of converted uh, into energy. Any questions on that so far? Okay. So at this point, since we're looking for actually both units, you do have a couple of different ways you could do it. Uh, you could go into Einstein's equation if you like and go that approach, which is E is equal to MC squared, where this would be 0 0.11828 AMU times our three times 10 to the eight meters per second squared. That gets us uh, looks like 1.06 times 10 to the 16. This again would be AMU meter squared second squared. It's a badass second squared, uh, which we then could use that Avogadro to the 26 conversion. 6.022 times 10 to 26 AMU in a kilogram. And if we do that, 
gets us 1.77 times 10 to the minus 11. And that will turn us into joules again because of the units here. This would be kilograms, meter squared, second squared in this particular case. Uh, professor? Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure the mass defect should be 0 0.11888. Is it? Let me try that again there. Thank you. Let's see. 6.1.00783 uh, plus 10 times 1.00866 minus point. Uh, Thank you, you're correct. Thank you, sorry about that. 1.11887, uh, 1 right? So, sorry about that. Eight, uh, we'll go 0.1189. Just round this here, try this again. 0 0.1189, there you go, thank you. And that means that obviously this, I'm just seeing numbers today, 0.1189 AMU. And then obviously that's going to change a few things here. So that would get us three to the eight squared. That's going to give us 1.06. Uh, still pretty close to, I think, on this one, I guess. So we still end up pretty close on that. Uh, and then that will get us probably pretty close on the other one there. Not too much damage, I think. 1.78, we'll call it then. All right, looking better, I hope, yes, thank you. Uh, so at this point, we've now converted it hopefully into joules. And um, <clears throat> now uh, again, doing this conversion gives us that in terms of the units, which is equal to a joule. So again, that's sort of how we go from there to there. It's a one-to-one -one relationship between those guys. Uh, at this point, uh, we then could divide it by the nucleon, which in this case is 16. And it looks like uh, we will end up with 1.11 times 10 to the minus 12 joules per nucleon. We also can convert this into mega electron volts per nucleon by taking our 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules per one mega electron volt. And if we do that, 1.602 to the minus 13, Looks like you get something like 6.931, we'll call it. Mega electron volts per nucleon as well. Question on that calculation there. Sorry about the extra number in there in between. Okay. Again, alternative to, again, doing Einstein's equation is, again, starting with the right mass defect number there, you can go this route and just kind of use those conversions we saw where we had something like an AMU is 931.5 mega electron volts. And you could just go 0.1189 times the 931.5 gives you 110.8 mega electron volts, which at that point you could divide by the 16 nucleons and hopefully should end up kind of where we ended up there, 6.92 as well. Oops. I think it's a time change. I'm having trouble writing numbers say 6.92 uh, kind of mega electron volts per nucleon, pretty close to what we got, you know, without rounding, depending on rounding. Um, <clears throat> and obviously you could use the conversion here to get there as well. Any questions on that particular one there? Um, Professor, what is the units um, on the right where it's like joules equals kilograms? This one here. So that's a relationship. Uh, one joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared second squared. So that's just a relationship. So um, when we do the sort of uh, Einstein's equation, we get close to that, but it's AMU per meter squared divided by second squared. So we do need to use that uh, conversion factor there 
uh, to get us to kilograms. So that's just a relationship that one joule is equal to basically those units. Other questions? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions on that? All right. All right, so let's take a look at another one here since I messed that one up pretty good. Let's see how we do on the next one here. All right, give this one a go here and uh, calculate the binding energy for iron 56 um, and see what you come up with. Again, uh, the proton is 1.00783 AMU. Uh, neutron 1.00866 AMU. And we got that, we got that. And again, see what you come up with here. Uh, professor? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. When I, when I asked for binding energy per nucleon. Yeah, uh, let's, let's, do, uh, let's do both again, why not? Let's do mega electron volts per nucleon. And uh, we'll do both joules per nucleon just to do both, just to make sure. Thank yeah, you. But generally, what when they just tell you binding energy per, per nucleon, what unit are they asking for? Truthfully, they most likely will uh, probably uh, tell you which one to give it in. If they don't, then technically you kind of do either one. These are probably the two, uh, I would say most popular is the way ready to say that, but uh, those are the most common sort of units probably used for this. So um, if they don't specify, technically you go either way. Um, but a lot of cases they will sort of specify which one to kind of give it in. Number of protons would be 26. Uh, number of neutrons would be uh, 56 minus 26, which is 30. So doing our mass defect here, um, we will end up with 26 times 1.00783 AMU plus uh, 30 times 1.00866 AMU. We're then gonna subtract that from the mass of the isotope, which is 55.93494. Um, and when we do that, uh, end up with a mass defect of 0 0.52844 AMU, I hope. Um, there was a question of, uh, should it always be a positive number? Um, if you set it up like we're doing here, probably should be a positive number, probably most of the time. It is possible to get sort of a negative number. And sometimes you'll see that because uh, sometimes people will do sort of the mass of the isotope minus the uh, sort of products there, or not the products, but the uh, protons and neutrons. Um, and that gives you pretty much the same difference as just a negative number. And one is just displaying whether or not you're talking about sort of uh, forming uh, the nucleus, or one is when you're breaking up the nucleus, which would be, again, a difference would be in terms of the energy uh, would be one would be negative, one would be positive sort of deal, depending on sort of what is happening. Um, in terms of the energy change for the atom. Not that I go with those arrows, but uh, but most of the time, if you sort of set it up this way, uh, sort of talking about sort of this uh, approach here, uh, you'll end up with a positive number here. Um, you could end up with a negative number. Again, it usually will happen by setting this up sort of opposite of each other. And what it just tells you in, in the end is sort of the energy number would end up being exothermic as it's releasing, as it's being sort of, uh, uh, making a part are, are coming together. So in this case, uh, if we wanted to, uh, we can use our mass defect and I'll do mega electron volts first this time. Uh, so why don't we go with this conversion here, which is an AMU 931.5 mega electron volts. That is going to get us 931.5 mega electron volts. We'll call it 492.5 two mega electron volts. We could then divide it by 56, which would be our nucleons. And that would get us, not that number, uh, bad day on the calculator here. Let's try this again, 56, 8.79, we'll call it. Mega electron volts per nucleon. 
uh, which would be one answer. And again, we could use that conversion of going from mega electron volts to joules. And that would give us sort of our joule answer here of, uh, what do we got there? Looks like uh, 1.408 times 10 to the minus 12 joules per nucleon. Any question on that calculation? Again, if you want sort of the Einstein approach, should get something fairly close to it. Uh, might be slightly different depending on sort of rounding, but it should be pretty close. Any questions on that calculation there? So what does all these sort of numbers tell us as uh, we've been kind of going through a few different ones here. So let us uh, take a look at some of the numbers here that we had. And if we go backwards here, oops, there we go. Uh, so we'll start with the, if we start with the, um, the fluorine just to get in the sort of the same unit. So we we'll take the fluorine that we did earlier. Um, 931.5 and that was 19 for the fluorine, I believe. So the fluorine was 7.78. The one that we just did here was uh, 6.931 and that was the carbon. So our fluorine 19 was uh, 7.78, we'll call it mega electron volts per nucleon. Our carbon 16 was 6.931 mega electron volts per nucleon. And our iron 56 was eight. So as we talked about, which we saw on that chart, if you remember that chart, the iron 56 was up there up on top as most stable. Again, has a higher binding energy per nucleon, followed in these three examples by the fluorine, and then the carbon would be the least in terms of stability. Again, you could use something like binding energy per nucleon as a measure of stability as well. Question on that. Question on binding energy, nuclear binding energy, how to calculate it, or anything of that nature. Okay, then uh, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about uh, some reactions. Don't worry about these reactions here. Sorry about the arrows. Uh, so we could do tra nuclear transmutation. Transmutation basically means uh, we basically have, uh, you know, an isotope or an, a stable, and we kind of shoot a particle at it and it makes it kind of unstable. And usually will lead to sort of a fission reaction occurring where it splits off into some new nucleuses and stuff like that. Uh, also gives off some particles. One way to do that is through sort of a particle accelerator, magnetic field, electrical field, gets it spinning really fast, the particle based on charge and size, and basically can shoot it at a target Sort of why here's just a, uh, a bunch of the transuranium elements, nuclear transmutation. And that's again how we sort of occur a lot of these. We shoot a neutron at it, neutron and alpha particle, alpha particles. Uh, you know, this is where we get some of the interesting name elements, right? Some of these man made elements, if you will, uh, carium, californium, Einsteinium, you know, all these sort of elements that are. For the most part, if you look at the periodic table down there in those two groups at the very bottom, or periods in the very bottom, uh, is where a lot of these guys are found. Again, basically sort of developed by doing that process of kind of shooting a particle at something, making it a little bit unstable and unhappy. And that is basically what can happen in a sort of a fission reaction such as this. And what's basically happening here is we have a neutron and this neutron is shooting out a uranium-235 element. It's going to make it very unhappy and unstable and also resemble a bowling pin in this case. It's going to go through fission and basically split off into these two new nucleuses. Also will produce 
some more neutrons also will produce a lot of energy as well in this reaction. Um, and as we talked about, again, the amount of energy that's sort of developed in a sort of nuclear reaction is much, much more than the kind of your uh, very exothermic chemical reaction. Uh, as we'll also talk about these formation of these neutrons are also important. Uh, again, if you think about what starts the reaction and you form some more of them, this is how these reactions, as we'll talk about, can sort of continue on and continue to go because sort of the product that you're making is sort of what keeps the reaction sort of going. Again, a comparison of coal is five times 10 to the seven joules. Again, the comparison there between coal and uranium is uh, in a nuclear power plant, that is essentially what they use as uranium as sort of this fuel. And again, you can see it gives off 10 to 13 joules per mole, while in a traditional sort of power plant, not wind or anything like that, but more traditional power plant, uh, they use to burn coal. And uh, it gives off obviously 10 to the seven in terms of energy, in terms of the amount that it gives off. Now, can we predict sort of what happens in a fission reaction in terms of, you know, what products that we get? And the answer is no. Um, you know, it doesn't always have to be the same two products uh, that will be developed here. And again, this reaction, 235 uranium, 92, plus that one neutron. And that gives us 90, uh, 38 strontium plus 143. 54 xenon and three neutrons. So, you know, these guys that come out, there's really no sort of prediction as to what happens. You don't always necessarily get the same two every time. You do usually get neutrons every time and you usually do get a lot of energy associated with it. But there is sort of a, a semi way you could kind of predict. So for the most part, as you can see, um, most of the products that come out you know, have mass numbers within this range. And again, won't always be the same two that come out, but you know, you could sort of predict a little bit in terms of the range of the mass numbers that you would expect to happen. So why is this reaction maybe not so good in certain cases? And it's because uh, a fusion reaction could sometimes do what is sometimes referred to as a nuclear chain reaction. And that is basically a self-sustaining sequence of basically fission reactions that continue to go. So if you think about what we just saw, what pretty much kicks it all off is a neutron hitting something. And then that guy gets unstable and splits off into some new nutri new nucleuses and a bunch of new neutrons, which then if you imagine could go back around and kind of start this whole process again. And before you know it, you are building out every time this reaction sort of getting exponentially larger as it continues to go. How do we sort of prevent that from happening? Well, um, there's something known as the critical mass and the critical mass is basically the amount of something like uranium that would be needed to sort of keep this reaction sort of sustained and fed and going, sort of exponentially growing. Um, and that's what we see over here in this picture at a critical mass of uranium, this process is gonna to continue to go and go and go. You may say to yourself, well, it's not so bad. Well, bad in the sense that every time it does so, it's creating a lot of energy and a lot of energy and a lot of energy, a lot of nuclear sort of products along the way as well. If you keep it sort of in a non-critical mass situation, you know, at some point you could kind of keep the reaction under control. It's not going to kind of grow exponentially like we see to the right and hopefully not cause too much damage. In terms of sort of a nuclear sort of bomb, that's sort of the idea here. They have a subcritical mass of uranium. Uh, they also have some explosives at the bottom. Obviously when it hits the explosive hit, the little wedge here basically fits into the wedge over here. And now these guys that were not critical mass become critical mass and kicks off this reaction. And obviously bad things happen in that case, uh, in addition to the energy, a lot of radioactive byproducts are basically being formed as a result of each of those sort of steps. 
Now, when we talk about sort of using, say, nuclear reactions for energy and, you know, the two sort of traditional way and nuclear way, traditional way is usually is burning coal. And nuclear is obviously a fission type reaction. And in case you're not sure, pretty much all power plants work kind of the same way in that sense. Uh, they basically have some water for the most part. You heat the water. When you heat the water, you create steam. Steam goes out to uh, the, the turbines, to the generators, and you know, you got some lights, hopefully. Uh, because it is steam, it also can be sort of condensed back down through condensation, cooled back down the steam, and this process goes. The difference in sort of traditional versus nuclear uh, power plants is sort of how you heat it. In a nuclear power plant, they use a fission reaction to heat up the water. In a traditional power plant, they burn coal, basically, to heat the water. And how they do that is, and this is sort of a cutout of a nuclear reactor here in a power plant. And there's a couple of different parts, uh, sort of a shielded part where the fission reaction takes place. And within this shielded part, they have what are referred to as fuel rods. Fuel rods are basically little rods that have like, you know, sometimes eraser size pellets of you, something like uranium. Uh, and that's where the sort of fission reaction basically kicks off. Fission reaction kicks off in this sort of shielded area here, uh, heats up the water that's in here. Water is kind of pumped through here in this kind of enclosed environment to heat up another set of water. Water creates the steam, it goes out, and like I said, to the turbines, to the generators, you get light, they kind of condense it back down, water comes back in, in, in this sort of circle. That's why a lot of times nuclear power plants are usually situated by water. For example, right there in San Onofre off the freeway, uh, by a big body of water, again, used to sort of cool everything down. Uh, if it can't be by a big body of water, they obviously will have a lot of big water towers sort of installed like uh, in Arizona, if you ever drove on 10, they have the Palo Verde over there off the 10 um, and they got some big towers, water towers and stuff like that uh, that's sort of used for that process. Why does this reaction, obviously they try to keep the sort of radioactive part away from the other part as well, but why does this reaction not go sort of out of control and crazy? Um, there's a couple sort of safety things that they use. One is they keep the uh, mass non-critical obviously. So they use a non-critical mass of uh, uranium. The other thing they have are these guys here, which are control rods. Inside a control rod are things that are soaked in like cadmium and such, and they're pretty much neutron absorbers. So why would neutron absorbers be very good thing and be used as a control rod? Well, again, if you think about sort of the fission reaction, it starts with a neutron, hits this thing, makes some new nucleuses and a bunch of new neutrons, right? So if you have these control rods in, what it does is sort of grab out some of these neutrons and thus prevents this sort of expanded growth that has here um, of the reaction, takes them sort of out of the reaction. There's less neutrons to come back around and sort of start the reaction up again. So um, these control rods are really vital to doing that, keeping the reaction under control, obviously keeping it as a non-critical uh, mass, also very important in terms of keeping the reaction under control. Any questions on that? Obviously, both have their perhaps maybe benefits and not so good benefits. Uh, obviously, traditional power plant, uh, you know, it does give a lot of pollutants in the air um, and uh, things like sulfur and carbon dioxide uh, sort of pollutants. In addition, obviously radioactive uh, waste is produced and a lot of problems is like, uh, where do you put all that? Who stores all that? Where do you kind of do those type of things? So for a lot of years, a lot of nuclear power plants basically just kind of kept everything on site and nobody wanted the uh, sort of waste traveling through their towns. I believe they opened up a big place there in uh, Nevada. I think they started using it um, and to sort of deal with all that kind of stuff. But it creates a big problem. If you just think about nuclear 
sort of waste and byproducts that occur as a nuclear reaction occurs, uh, a graph like this, for example, you get a lot of stuff that are sometimes referred to as spent fuel. And spent fuel are sort of like, you know, the byproducts of this fission reaction. But the problem with it in terms of storage is if you look at where a lot of these guys are, you know, we're talking about a lot of years of storage of this sort of material until it's sort of safe, if you will. And obviously, you know, what do you do with it? Where do you keep it? You know, who keeps in charge of it? So there's a lot of issues, obviously, uh, that's with nuclear chemistry. Some people say, obviously, it's cleaner in a sense that you're not burning coal, um, but obviously it has its own set of sort of products that occur. Another important sort of reaction is what is referred to as a fusion reaction. And I got to refix these arrows they are all over the place, but uh, I'll just rewrite one here so you can see it. But a fusion reaction is, uh, again, uh, a little bit different than a fission reaction. In a fusion reaction, we're actually taking two smaller nucleuses and kind of put them together to make a larger one and results in a certain amount of energy. This is usually done at very, very high temperatures like uh, you're walking on the sun type temperatures, you know, not pretty high uh, type of temperature that this occurs in this case and again, gives off a, a good amount of energy. So fission, basically a lot of times is sort of the spontaneous breakdown of a nucleus or can be induced by a neutron or a particle starting the fission reaction where it splits off into two new nucleuses and uh, some neutrons and some energy. Fusion is where we kind of fuse, like the name sounds, fuse together two smaller nucleuses to make a larger one as well. Now, in terms of uh, radioactivity and nucleus and isotopes, we can use them in medicine. And they are sometimes used a lot in medicine for different things. Uh, like you can see here, are some examples. Oops. Um, sodium 24 is used as a blood flow tracer. Uh, you know, fluorine 18 is used um, as a positron emission and brain imaging iodine is used. And the nice thing about sort of isotopes is that they pretty much will behave just like their sort of non-radioactive counterparts in the body. And what that means is obviously if you do some type of scan, you can kind of follow the radioactivity of these isotopes and sort of see where it ends up. And it will sort of highlight things as you can kind of see on the scan here, uh, highlight certain areas by basically just kind of working in your body like normal uh, sort of the, these elements would do in your body as well. You just have sort of a, a benefit of sort of a trace sort of, sort of aspect where you could kind of follow what's happening here. Um, also, you know, you could use things like for a bone scan, like we see in this picture. Clearly, if we're using something for uh, medicine, you usually want a small half-life. So usually if you're using something for you know, medical type purposes, you don't want the half-life to be obviously years and years and years. Otherwise the person is gonna be kind of radioactive for a while and the follow-up appointment would be a way long time down the road. So something very small in terms of the half-life. Uh, people also sometimes use radioactive isotopes to implant into tumors and stuff like that. That used to be done a lot uh, to sort of shrink them and stuff. Um, so that sometimes is used. This is a tool that's also used with radioactivity a lot. Uh, this is what is known as a Geiger counter. Uh, it's used to sort of measure radioactivity around you. If you ever work with radioactivity, you'd be familiar with the Geiger counter, you kind of move it around. It beeps when it sort of senses radioactivity um, through a sort of anode cathode sort of reaction that occurs there. Um, you know, usually if you're doing something with uh, radioactivity, if you're working with radioactivity, in addition to using something like this, obviously gloves, lab coat, a lot of times they will give you like a little ring to wear, a little badge to wear, and every so often they'll kind of develop it. A lot of times, years ago, you used to have like film in it, kind of develop it and see, you know, how much exposure you've had uh, to radioactivity. Um, if we use a Geiger counter and move it around, it will, if you just hold it up in the air, it will beep. Uh, hopefully it's going to be very loud, but it will be. There is what is sometimes referred to as background radiation. And you often hear that a lot, especially the person going around trying to test everything. Oh, it's just background and stuff like that. But uh, you will hear it beep. It won't be silent. Um, 
because again, you know, there is sort of radioactivity all sort of around us. Here are some sort of uh, areas where we do sort of get that radioactivity, um, you know, in the ground and surroundings, uh, medical and x-rays, how much air travel you do. If you happen to live, I guess, near a nuclear waste sort of area or something like that, um, you know, and it depends, you know, how it affects somebody. It depends on, you know, sort of a two types of situations here. One is sometimes referred to as a rad, which is a radiation absorbed dose. And one is known as a REM, which is sort of the equivalent sort of effect on a person. What really does affect it though is sort of uh, the type of emission. Uh, if it's a gamma ray versus a beta ray versus say a alpha particle as to sort of the effect before you see any type of damage. So normally we want to, if you're working with obviously nuclear reaction, nuclear reaction, working with new, um, radioactive chemicals, I guess I'll say it that way. Um, obviously exposure time you use, you want to a minimum, you obviously want an appropriate sort of uh, protection. Again, it may require lead, may require shielding and that type of stuff. And obviously the main thing is a lot of times exposure. So minimizing your exposure is always a good idea. And with that, I think that ends chapter 19. Any questions on any of that stuff there? That also should then be the, and again, you can see alpha particles is uh, 20 in terms of this factor. Remember, if you remember the alpha particle didn't penetrate as far as say the gamma ray. So you could get a little bit more exposure to alpha than say gamma. And that's why their factor is so large. Um, the exam uh, will cover through chapter 19 is guess what I was trying to say there. Um, so again, a reminder that we did move the exam from this coming Wednesday to the Monday we come back. Next week is spring break, I believe. So uh, the exam will be, I guess, two weeks from today. So uh, two weeks from today, it will cover basically our titrations, our buffers, our KSP, if I'm not mistaken, and it should be nuclear chemistry. So I think that is uh, 15, 16, and 19. Any questions on that? Again, we'll do it just like we've done it before. To, we'll do it during lab time on that Monday. And a reminder as well that we're moving um, group two to Wednesday. So we're gonna do group two. And then we're going to swap the exam the Monday we come back. That also should mean that the homework is due. I haven't had a chance to change the dates, but I will. Um, but uh, so I think there's still a schedule for the end of this week or something, but I will change them. Yeah. We are scheduled to do lab 12 today, I believe, which is, I don't even know what it's in that lab. I have to top my head anymore, but I think it's, uh, it is lab 12, whatever that should be. <clears throat> there might not been a pre-lab for it. So I, I don't recall off the top of my head. So if there wasn't one up there, then there might not been. Other questions on that? Okay, so we're gonna start here, uh, chapter 17, gonna switch gears just a little bit from nuclear chemistry. Uh, we're gonna talk about really thermodynamics in this chapter. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about entropy, we're going to talk about free energy, and we're going to talk about equilibrium, because um, we can't leave that guy out. But when we do talk about sort of uh, these clever guys, they do tie into maybe a thermodynamic value you remember, which is delta H, which again is enthalpy, which is that heat of the reaction, uh, not to be confused with what we'll see in this chapter, which is delta S, which is the entropy. And we'll talk about what that is and not to be confused with Delta G, which is our Gibbs free energy. So the good news is, as you can see, we get to use some different letters. So that's kind of nice, uh, but our good friend equilibrium cannot be left out. So we will come back and tie it into our good friend K at this point as well. But what we're really talking about here in this sort of chapter is thermodynamics and what thermodynamics sort of really deals with is this idea of uh, sort of spontaneity and is a reaction spontaneous? 
is a reaction, non-spontaneous. Now, when we talk about a reaction being sort of spontaneous or non-spontaneous, um, what we're talking about is the idea of, will this reaction under these conditions basically occur? Um, and if the answer is yes, then we're talking about things that are spontaneous reactions. If the answer is no, then it's going to be a non-spontaneous reaction. Because a spontaneous reaction occurs, it does not mean if you say this reaction is spontaneous, it does not necessarily mean that this reaction will occur, boom, super fast. It may occur very fast, it may occur sort of regular sort of speed, if you will, and may occur very slow. So we're not talking about anything in terms of speeds of reactions or rates of reactions. That is where we cover kinetics, which we'll talk about at the end of the semester. But here we're just really focusing on pretty much that idea of, you know, under these specific conditions of whatever we're talking about, would I expect this reaction to occur? And if the answer is yes, again, I, I don't necessarily know if it's going to be fast or slow, but I know that, you know, if it is slow, if I wait long enough, the reaction should occur if it's fast and obviously it would occur very quickly. So these are all some spontaneous examples of physical and chemical sort of processes. Uh, we have water, a waterfall usually comes downhill. Water running uphill doesn't usually happen too much, I don't think. Uh, if you have some type of sugar, it would dissolve in coffee. Uh, one atmosphere and zero degrees, that's where we have water freezing and kind of above zero is where we have ice melting. When we talk about heat and energy, it does flow from really the hotter object to the colder one. Hotter gets cooler, cooler guy gets warmer. Um, iron, when it's exposed to oxygen, pretty much just needs a little bit of moisture and some O2 and it's good to go. And that will be a spontaneous reaction. The person going downhill in terms of the skiing there is spontaneous and doesn't look too happy to see the person coming up the hill. Clearly, if you were skiing, I'm just assuming that if you are at the bottom of the hill, you're not going to spontaneously find yourself going up the hill. You need to make that non-spontaneous process occur and you make it occur by actually, right, just kind of skiing yourself up the hill. And we'll talk about sort of in a, a later chapter, you know, it is possible to sort of turn a non-spontaneous maybe event into a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous event could occur. But again, it does require some type of input of something, maybe energy or something like that to allow it to happen. We have two sort of uh, tubes here uh, separated by a valve, which on my screen is a little bit hard to see, but there is like a valve right there and it's sort of two sort of glass containers that have gas molecules in it. Uh, a spontaneous reaction would be if you kind of open this valve, you know, these guys would probably start to fill the other side like we would expect. A non-spontaneous would be if we had sort of the same idea and you open the valve here, but we had gas molecules on both sides. They probably all won't decide, hey, let's just head over there and, and end up at the left-hand side. Not by themselves, they probably wouldn't. Maybe if you maybe heated up that side and encouraged them that way, maybe they would go that way, but uh, not spontaneously would that occur. So sometimes though, when people think about you know, spontaneous reactions, they also try to think about the idea of exothermic reactions. So remember that when we talk about an exothermic reaction, we're relating it to delta H. And again, delta H is negative in that case, means it's exothermic, which means heat and energy would be released. And if the delta H is positive, it would be endothermic. Heat and energy would be absorbed. So these are all processes that uh, are spontaneous reactions. And we do see that some of them are exothermic, like our combustion reaction or formation of water. We also see that some of them are endothermic as they have positive values here. Uh, melting of ice is what that is. And basically dissolving an ionic solid in water is what that is. So what this shows us is we can't really rely upon enthalpy or the heat of the reaction to make that determination of whether or not a reaction is spontaneous or not. 
it does help obviously in a lot of cases having a exothermic reaction does a lot of times sort of help in terms of spontaneity but we really can't use that as sort of the defining factor of this reaction is going to be spontaneous because it's exothermic while this reaction is going to be non-spontaneous because it's endothermic again the bottom two there sort of disprove that those two are definitely spontaneous reactions. If you just think about taking an ice cube out, it's going to start to melt, right? If you take it out of the freezer and that's because it's going to kind of spontaneously pick up that energy from the outside and go through that melting process. Um, and again, if you put just a little bit of, you know, a solid in water that will dissolve, it will kind of dissolve relatively easy and pretty spontaneously, maybe one little stir and it's sort of gone and dissolved and stuff like that. So although it does help in it, we can't use enthalpy as sort of our overwhelming factor for determining spontaneity. So what we can sort of use in certain cases is what is known as entropy. And entropy is sometimes related as the change in entropy, delta S. And one thing about entropy that's a little bit different than say delta H and we'll see it a couple of places, is actually units. So delta H is usually in kilojoules. Delta S is usually in joules in terms of the units. But what is entropy? Well, entropy is basically the randomness or disorder in a system, right? So a lot of times when we talk about thermodynamics and stuff like that, we talk about two things, which one is the system. That's sort of what we're interested in. Could be the beaker, could be the test tube, whatever is happening. And then we basically have the surroundings, right? Which is pretty much everybody else outside of that. Now, when we increase the order, when things get more ordered, the entropy actually decreases and vice versa. If we increase the disorder, things get more crazy and random, the actual entropy value gets larger. And that's a little bit different than a lot of people think about delta H and negatives and positives. Actually, again, delta S will become more positive when the amount of disorder increases. Delta S will become more negative when the amount of disorder decreases. That is the same as saying order increases. So sometimes that also confuses people with entropy is the idea. Some people talk about disorder. Some people talk about order. I guess I would recommend choosing one of those and keeping it in your head straight. So if we're talking about disorder, if the disorder, the amount of craziness, randomness increases, the Delta S will be positive. If the amount of disorder decreases, the delta S will be negative. The relation to that is if the amount of order increases, it will be negative. And if the amount of order decreases, it will be positive. So again, choose one way disorder and think about it that way or think about it in terms of order, trying maybe not to do both because sometimes people will get confused sort of on that aspect of it. How do we figure out the change in entropy, which is the delta S value? Basically, it's our final state minus our initial state. So if we sort of end up in a state where there's a lot more disorder, we would expect the delta S to be positive. And if we end up in a state where there's more order and less disorder, we will end up with a negative one for delta S. Very common way to look at disorder, and we see it is with actual states. If you think about the solid state, everybody's packed in there relatively tight to each other, not a lot of room and movement. There is a lot of order, a lot less disorder, and it has a very small sort of entropy value. As you go to liquid, everybody's moving around a little bit more. So we're creating more disorder as we go into the liquid phase. As we go from the liquid phase to the solid phase, Things are bouncing around, moving around, flying around as their gases. And that's obviously a lot more disorder and it has the greatest entropy value. You could sort of predict that by just looking at it, sort of a formula sometimes or an equation. Here we're going from solid to liquid. So we're going from a situation in solid where things are very, very ordered 
to a situation in liquid where things are starting to move around and there's more disorder. Again, we're increasing the disorder here. We could very accurately predict for this reaction that the delta S value should end up being a positive number because of that. Any questions on that? Now, disorder is related to probability and a probable event is one where there is many ways that that can occur. An improbable event is one where, you know, there's only kind of like one or very few ways of accomplishing something. So if you think about it, if you're in like a room that has multiple doors to enter and exit, windows that open, all those kind of things, you know, if you had to get out of that room in an emergency, it's probably pretty probable that you would be able to find a way out of the room. Now, if you find yourself in a room where, you know, there's really no doors to get in and out, not sure how you got in there in the first place, by the way. And, you know, there's maybe just one little small little window that kind of flips up that you could kind of squeeze yourself out of. If you're in that room with a lot of people, it's probably very improbable that everybody gets out of that room okay uh, because of that. So when we have an ordered state, there's a very low probability of that occurring and we have a very small entropy. Um, you know, in order to get everybody back together sort of correctly and stuff like that, there's like that whole saying, you know, there's like one way to do it correctly. And, you know, that means there's a very low probability that people will do things correctly. Um, so it has a very small entropy. There's a very high probability that if you needed to do something, you know, you might screw it up, right? And so there's a greater chance of screwing something up. And that's a very high probability of occurring and a very large entropy value, uh, especially if you're making something like a nice crystal where, you know, you have to get everything solid and coming together correctly. One way that we look at sort of probability and sort of entropy and this is what is sometimes referred to as the Boltzmann equation. And that's this equation here. S is entropy. K is the Boltzmann constant, which is down here. And natural log of W. W is the number of microstates, sort of the different ways that you could accomplish something. So if we look at sort of our example over here, we basically got four circles. And if we want to put all four circles on one side of our box here, there's really only one way to do that. Either they all go on the left-hand side or all go on the one, the right-hand side. Only really one way to do that. If we wanted like one circle and three, there's kind of four different ways you could accomplish that. If we want to put two circles in each box, there's like six different ways of accomplishing that. So when we look at sort of this equation, the more probable way and more probability of achieving something would be obviously the two circles in each box, right? There's six different ways that you could kind of achieve that versus there's only one way to achieve sort of all circles in one box. And we just think about this equation and we just think about math of this equation. If the number of microstates is one, when I take this times the natural log of one, natural log of one equals zero, which means I have a very low entropy value. If I just take my same equation there and my natural log of six, I end up with like K times 1.79 and you know, 1.79 K basically not zero. So a larger entropy value than what we would have in a very small way of doing that. So the number of ways you could accomplish something has an effect. Obviously, if you do the natural log of four, you get like 1.4 in terms of the number it would be. So you could see that the more ways we could accomplish something, the larger the entropy value becomes. And obviously if you continue down this path, that number would be larger. Again, larger the entropy value, the more disorder there is, and probably again, more probable event that's going to occur. Any question on that? And again, you know, probably more ways to mess something up and do it wrong than to do things the right way. So uh, that's another way you can kind of think of it. All right, we will.